Amen. Uh, on be, uh, my name is Gabriel Achaye, and I am privileged this afternoon to welcome you for yet another exciting capacity building session uh, organized by the East Africa Law Society. And uh, this afternoon, we are privileged to be discussing energy transition, global trends and opportunities in renewable energy. So as you may know, uh, uh, the world is now moving from fossil-based fuel systems and it's, uh, it's, it's going more into renewable-based systems like solar, wind, biofuel, and hydrogen. And this afternoon, we have convened this uh, special panel of experts to discuss this energy transition. What are the opportunities that are available in this energy transition? What are the global trends that are affecting it? And this afternoon, again, we are profoundly honored to have the session moderated by Ms. Lynn Gitu. Ms. Lynn Gitu is the program leader at IMPACT, Transforming Natural Resource Management. She's a legal professional with legal with a passion for social justice. She specializes in conflict analysis, policy analysis, women's empowerment, and natural resource governance. Ms. Gitu has previously served and held different positions in national and international uh, non-governmental organizations, implementing and managing advocacy programming focused on better management of energy and extractives in East and Central Africa. She currently leads the impact impacts work in mineral certification and due diligence in English speaking countries in Africa's Great Lakes region and coordinates projects across Uganda, including a UNEP led one code named Planet Gold that works to eliminate use of mercury in processing ASM gold. Lynn, we are honored to have you and it's now my profound honor to uh, hand over the floor to you to take us through today's session. Over to you, Lynn. Thank you, Gabriel. And thank you everybody for making the time. We are already at uh, at least 50 uh, attendees with nine panelists. And so this is a good way to start. I hope your afternoon is going well. And if it is morning where you are, I hope you have woken up on the right side of the bed. Today, we're going to discuss uh, energy transition. And as Gabriel has said, a lot is um, being discussed about it across the world, because as we probably all know a, a little bit, each one of us, uh, the world is talking about moving away from the use of fossil fuels which we understand in our daily lives as um, petroleum, uh, which is diesel, kerosene, um, uh, fuel, well, pet petrol, petrol fuel, aviation fuel, and, and all the rest to renewable energy options uh, for us to, to do the things that we, we do in our daily lives, whether it is cooking or it's driving um, or it's taking a train. So, we're going to discuss that and how, how that interacts with uh, legal frameworks across the world, but also more specifically in East Africa, which is where we, we the East Africa Law Society is, uh, is, uh, is set up. We'll, we'll start right off with just five minutes for us to type in the chat. Um, if you were to have a superpower, what would that superpower be? If you had a superpower, if you had a choice to choose uh, a superpower to have, uh, maybe you can fly or maybe you can read people's thoughts. Uh, what would that superpower be? So just five minutes for us to sort of break the ice and, and get to know each other just a little bit. Hey, people are shy. Teleporting. 
<laughs> ah, we want to be in places without using transport. <laughs> then energy transition wouldn't matter to you. Time travel? Star. I don't know if I want to go back to the past. Reading minds? Mm. Mm. X-ray vision? Oh, X-ray vision. Hmm, I'm a bit nervous about that, that superpower. Mind reading. Hmm. People want to read minds. Do you really want to know what people are thinking about you at any one time? I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Anybody else? People are shy. I don't know why. Or maybe all of us kind of think the same. Mending broken hearts, choker gems. <laughs> that one, that is, ah, that is too ambitious. Hmm? So you break them, then you mend them. That's a superpower. Okay. The five minutes are not up, but um, I think let's let's go right ahead. Thank you for participating for a minute or so. Um, we'll go right into it, and we'll start off this this time together with a presentation or a, a discussion from uh, Professor Kariuki Mugua. I hope I have pronounced that the name properly who is a professor of law at the University of Nairobi, Faculty of Law. Uh, professor holds a Doctor of Philosophy degree in law from the University of Nairobi. He's done so many things. And Prof, if you will allow me, um, I'll just say that you have so many accolades. You are an advocate of the High Court uh, of Kenya for over 30 years and you practice at Karaoke Mugia and Company Advocates. Um, Prof will, will take us through the, the, the introductory session where we, we will want to, um, to get into discussing the, 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 the trends, the, the, we'll talk about how East African states and, and we'll talk about strategies that the East African states, partner states can adopt to accelerate energy transition within the region. But he'll take a couple of minutes before he, he dives into that, that very um, uh, presentation. He'll take a couple of minutes to take us through the background of energy transition. What is it and how does it connect to different sectors that affect us in our daily living? I'll be sharing my screen and please let me know if you are not able to see what is showing on the screen. Prof, you are very welcome to take it away. Let me just look for the share screen button. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. It's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to be described as an expert, even when I'm not. However, it is possible to be an expert in this area within just a few minutes. The area is uh, the area of energy. I have seen what you've written on the charts. You'd like to flash, move uh, from one area to the other. But uh, this afternoon, we shall reflect on energy transition in the region. Uh, and we are thinking about the region of uh, East Africa. And mine is to just make it as simple as uh, possible. I was invited to speak a few weeks back. I have written a paper called Accelerating Energy Transition in East Africa. That paper is available in, you are going to avail it to the participants after this. I have also done a bit of work in this area. I have books and my books are not for sale. They are available for you, all of them, for free download uh, in regard to the area of sustainable development energy, energy justice, and so on. But uh, I wanted to speak for two minutes to tell you what energy transition is, because I don't want to assume that we all know. 
But let me begin by telling you that energy transition is a shift to a clean, green, and sustainable sources of energy. Uh, let's let's go back to the, the yeah. It is we've always argued that energy is a fundamental human right. You need energy to do so many things, and uh, it is situated. And this you need to get that uh, access to energy is vital for sustainable development. That development that takes care of uh, the present and future generations. But we have problems within the energy sector. It is not accessible to everyone. We have problems like lack of clean cooking facilities because people use fossil fuels to cook. And we have the whole background of the climate change problem. So energy transition then is this transition that uh, looks at how do we shift to clean, green, and sustainable sources. So, and uh, we then focus on what is called renewable energy. Internationally, it's supported by a whole legal framework where you find it if you're looking for it as a lawyer. The lawyers uh, have this idea of where do you look for the law? And you find it in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCC, the Paris or Paris, uh, Paris Agreement. You also find it in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the SDGs, SDG 7, which, which talks about affordable, reliable, and modern energy services, energy efficiency, clean energy, research and technology in this area, and it discusses how to ensure access to affordable, reliable, and modern energy for all. SDG 7, you cannot ignore it. And then there is Agenda 2063. This is the African Union agenda. It talks about that kind of energy transition uh, to clean energy. At the East African community level, we have the East African Community Climate Change Policy. Within it, you find a discussion on energy transition within Kenya, where I come from. There is the Energy Act of Kenya. There's also the National Energy Policy and the Climate Change Act of Kenya. All of them will address energy from different standpoints. The Climate Change Act will talk about energy from the point of uh, having clean climate so that we get rid of greenhouse gases and so on. So there have been some investments in renewable energy, but uh, as you see within uh, the debate that we are going to have, it is not enough. There has been improvement in access to uh, electricity, access to electricity. There have been commitments to transition the energy sector. So everybody within the national determined uh, contributions is saying, this is part of what we are going to deal with, but there have been challenges. And a part of it is that universal access to electricity is yet to be realized. Um, lack of access to clean cooking, and this is a major issue. Uh, it's also a gender issue because uh, the people who do most of the cooking, most of it, are women. Then there have been inadequate investments in renewable energy sources. And there is uh, basically underutilization of the potential of uh, renewable energy. So what do we need to do? There, we need to continually adopt uh, and put in investments in renewable energy. Public-private partnerships, as you see in our discussions, are very, very important. How do we finance it? Strengthening local financial institutions is important. How do we enhance access to electricity within the, the towns and rural areas. It's something we think we need to think about. How do we enhance energy efficiency and reliability? Because the lack of reliability of uh, this clean energy is what drives people to go into the dirty energy or fossil fuel based energy. How do we effectively access clean cooking facilities but quite importantly now at a regional level, how do we have regional integration in the energy sectors to ensure that the whole region is moving forward in one direction? Because as we say, 
um, as we conclude, we say there needs to be um, energy transition in East Africa, and it has very, very many benefits. They include job creation, energy security, universal access, clean air, safer climate. And there's immense potential for energy transition in East Africa. How can we harness that? The region is abundant in renewable energy, wind, solar, geothermal, and hydropower. So we then say then in conclusion that energy transition in East Africa is necessary for sustainable development. Let me just leave it there as an uh, introduction, then we can take it from there. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was precise, three minutes, um, very appreciative of, of that. Um, I think we will continue to, to, to have discussions uh, about the transition. And I'm thinking since we have started like this, uh, which I think we've, we've started well, uh, maybe we, we, we start with you, um, Madam Beatrice Nyavira. And I'm thinking about this because we've already gotten a, a background on what energy transition is and, and what, you know, that there are opportunities that are available for the, for the region. And so maybe we could go, we could delve into what the opportunities and challenges for lawyers are um, with who want to advise within this sector. But first, let me um, introduce our esteemed um, panelist. So Beatrice Nyabira is a partner and head of projects, uh, energy and restructuring practice group, DLA Piper Africa within uh, Kenya. Uh, they are called IKM advocates. She's She has 18, over 18 years experience um, in projects, energy and restructuring, and has acted for clients across the entire value chain, including public sector entities, commercial lenders, development finance institutions, NGOs, and project sponsors in, in energy, um, as well as those that are involved in infrastructure and public procurement. Uh, she's been across Africa, she's done her work across Africa, and, and so we are privileged to have her as part of this panel too. In a few minutes, the few minutes that we have, uh, discuss the topic of opportunities and challenges for lawyers advising in within the energy transition um, sector. Uh, please take it away, Beatrice. Um, thank you, Lynn. Um, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are. I think I'm I'm so excited to be uh, participating in this webinar. It's it's one of the first forums that I've seen where it's you know strictly for lawyers. I think I think that's the understanding. You know the issue is that um, in the energy space, um, lawyers have tended to shy away. Um, so you do find that um, you know it's sort of seen as a space that's for engineers or you know very technical people, but um, the truth of the matter is that there's actually room for every specialization and lawyers are particularly important. So I'm going to say this uh, from, from experience because um, now at, at IKM, um, I think the kind of role we play is really one of the opportunities that's available for the lawyers. So we are legal advisors on energy projects and we've advised on projects of, of different scales. So there are those that connect to the um, to the grid and there are also smaller captive plants. So, so there's opportunities there. So um, I think the role of a lawyer when you're a say transaction advisor, you would assist say when it comes to you know legal due diligence. Um, before the project starts, you look at the procurement issues because a lot of these energy projects would um, require, say, an off-taker who may end up being a public utility. So you have to look at how you've, your client uh, has been onboarded. Uh, you look at the agreements. Um, you look at how the risk is shared. So that's that's one type of opportunity that's there. 
Um, I think there's a big buzzword now about uh, carbon markets is another area that's really emerging that lawyers need to be uh, keen on and look at. Um, I think some of the projects are selling carbon credits and one needs to then position themselves to understand, you know, what kind of agreements, um, you know, cover this, this kind of a transaction. How can I position myself in the market? Who are the clients? So that's another another area. Um, across the board, there's always an energy regulator in every country. It's one of those regulated enterprises. And these energy regulators have in-house counsel. So the in-house counsel role is also available for you, either at a regulator or at the public utility. Um, you know, it may even be within the developer um, the developer's company because even internally they do need someone who looks at um, you know the regulatory angle. Are they complying with what the legal requirements are? Are their contracts being followed? So so that's another opportunity. And then just to make to bring this home to show that there's actually room for everybody, even if your predominant work is in dispute resolution. Again, this kind of projects. A lot of them are for long periods of time. So you're looking, say, at a 20-year contract or a 15-year or 10-year. That's a long time. And they tend to be in certain, you know, in, in, in such scenarios. Uh, situations change, dynamics change, relationships change. So sometimes there's actually, um, you know, uh, really incidents or opportunities um, arise where, now dispute resolution lawyers are required. A lot of the contracts that are signed already provide, say, for arbitration. Yeah, When it's the larger projects, they will say ICC uh, in London or wherever it is. Uh, and I know there's a push now to have some of these brought, uh, brought closer, although there's always the debate about you know a neutral jurisdiction and the like. But these really are opportunities for us. Um, the lender, on the lender side, we have lawyers who work with lenders. Um, there's very specialized financing for this kind of project. And again, those are very specialized lawyers, and that's an opportunity that one can pursue. Um, I liked the professor's um, presentation. I think one of the biggest areas is what we are calling ESG, environmental social governance, um, because these projects touch on human lives. At the end of the day, when you're putting up your project, um, you find sometimes you have to displace people because if, say, it's a wind project and you're putting up, you know, the turbines, um, you know, sometimes you have to relocate people who are there because the wind will blow best at a certain area, not everywhere. So those kind of issues come up. There's issues around, you know, the impact on the environment. Um, you know, so there are many concerns around that, about compensation, so, so all those are issues that uh, lawyers need to now familiarize um, themselves with. In terms of challenges, I think um, what, one of the things is that, as always happens in any regulated environment, um, sometimes the regulator runs behind. So industry innovates, and then now the regulator or the lawmaker has to catch up, yeah? So that is something we see a lot, and we do find that sometimes, um, you know, your 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 testing, you know, uncharted waters, yeah. So you do find, for example, I can use the Kenyan example. We have an energy act that talks about certain things, including how if you have some solar on your roof, you can sell the excess back to the grid. But we don't have regulations yet to operationalize that. Huh? So you find sometimes there are gaps. So I think, how do you carry people along? Because at the end of the day, uh, you still want to achieve um, the best outcome for your client, but you also have to work within a framework that's sustainable. So that's one of the challenges that, that, that comes up. And then another issue is around um, very many stakeholders involved in such projects. We already talked of uh, people like um, communities, um, you know, and there's regulators, there's communities, there's the developers, there's lenders, there's, there's so many people. Um, so you find that it's very important to do proper mapping upfront 
yeah, so that you do, you know, which are the stakeholders, how are they impacted, what do you need to do and prepare a proper plan, um, you know, as to how you can deal with that. Some of these challenges um, can be overcome. Um, I think as a lawyer, you, you, you have some personal challenges as well. You have to stay informed on, you know, what's happening on, uh, especially now that we're talking about a just transition, we're looking at what are the developments. So you have to make sure that you make yourself available. Is it for conferencing? Um, and there are very many conferences that are available for, for this kind of subject. Um, is it ongoing education that you need to participate in? Yeah, then specialize, try and build some expertise in, 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 in the topic. Collaborate. Uh, we've already said that there are different specialities that are involved. And lawyers need to not shy away because we always think, you know, we only know the legal part. You actually need to understand the whole solution that your client provides. So not to the extent that an engineer does, but you have to engage with them. And and if if there's a project meeting that has, you know, different specialities, you need to attend so that, you know, the more you listen to the other people talking, if it's a financial expert who is saying about the viability and someone else talking about the technical solution, that's how you learn. So you need to collaborate. Um, you know, if it's the environmental, the social governance people, you have to collaborate with them and then facilitate um, a lot of engagement. I think that's something that's 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 very useful. Um, you know, actively networking, um, you know, meeting people who are in the industry. I think something else we find as a challenge, and, and probably I hope the professor will mention this as he speaks, um, sometimes we find the curriculum is not um, really so practical. Um, I think the what is taught in the schools or the universities may not be the same as what is needed in the market. So I think that in itself is a challenge because I've, I've spoken with many people and they say that, you know, the graduates that they get are not really ready for, for industry. So even in academia, and probably it's an opportunity and a challenge, um, you know, there is room, even as the curricula is being developed, to also incorporate some people from the market, even for guest lectures and the like, who can come and you know complement whatever curriculum is is available. And I guess um, maybe I can close there for now. Um, yeah, happy to take any further questions. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You you touched on um, on different on different parts. Uh, which are important. You've not just talked about the, the challenges and the opportunities, but you've also talked about some strategies that that um, any given lawyer within the region can can uh, uh, can look towards to to make sure that they are relevant we, within the sector. That transition is happening. Energy transition is not just a story; it actually is happening. Um, and there is a global move uh, towards it. So the earlier we, we get acquainted with it, get more comfortable with it, uh, look for ways in which we can plug in um, as legal professionals, the better for us. At this point, um, I think I will turn the mic, I'll give the mic to, uh, to Mr. James Mohindo, um, who is currently a, a private public private dialogue and tax spe specialist at the United States Agency for International Development um, in Uganda. Uh, he will be tackling the, the topic energy transitions and the global trends that energy transition is taking and the emerging issues within the East African community. James is um, an advocate of the High Court of Uganda with a passion for social and economic justice. He has experience in the areas of natural resource governance, fiscal policy, and the extractive industry. He's been in the extractive, extractive industry uh, space for about a decade now. And, and he, even as he's currently working with USAID, the Domestic Resource Mobilization for Development um, Activity, he, he's He's worked with civil society. Um, he's currently the chairperson of the board of the network. 
or public interest lawyers in Uganda. And he also advises on um, the, the, the Inclusive Natural Resource Development uh, Committee at the Uganda Law Society. James, please uh, take it away. Uh, you, you have about 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Lynn, for that introduction. Uh, well, I, I would like to thank Professor for the background laid and uh, Beatrice for the context shared. Actually, I, uh, insofar as their presentations are concerned, I've been an attendant and I've taken a lot of notes. Thank you for sharing and for the opportunities I've shared. Um, in terms of uh, uh, energy transition and uh, global context, we, we have to look at uh, it as a shared by Prof that it was informed largely by uh, climate change with uh, increasing concern about the impact of uh, unclean forms of energy. Uh, the international community is looking at what can be done to mitigate the damage we are causing to the planet. And one of the places where uh, international community and the science has uh, zeroed down on uh, emissions from uh, use of fossil fuels for energy. And uh, fossil fuels uh, include uh, the likes of uh, coal and oil and all other uh, energies that require uh, uh, emission of gases for them to be able to generate uh, the energy. So it's from that that we now have this uh, uh, energy transition conversation, which is looking at moving from the forms of energy that pollute the environment to make it as uh, to keep the language basic to forms of energy that do not pollute the environment. So for the global north, there is actually a big concern and because uh, of uh, that uh, principles of environmental protection and governance are in the I, in the UNFCC uh, which include the uh, same but differentiated responsibilities on all uh, state parties even us as the global south uh, having to draw attention to the need to transition from the use of uh, energies that are not clean to those that are clean. So uh, the, there are different energy uh, mixes that different countries have. And I wanted uh, for purposes of this conversation to share, uh, for example, Uganda's energy mix, which includes uh, biomass that accounts for about 90%. And I will share why uh, that, that, that percentage is important. And then we have uh, oil products, which account for about 8%, and hydroelectricity accounting for 2%. So in the effort to transition to clean energies, we are trying to say, what is in this biomass uh, 90%? How is it affecting the environment? And what can we do to move away from uh, the use of that uh, whatever biomass uh, we are using. The same applies to oil products. Hydroelectricity is uh, classified as clean. And I, I think as uh, Prof will share later, uh, may speak to what other energies are being uh, recommended, but it's basically each state party being called upon to take measures to reduce the use of energy forms that affect uh, the environment negatively. And uh, how are these uh, uh, global trends impacting the East African community? Some of the uh, major impacts is the change both in rhetoric and also policy and strategy at national level, where uh, unlike what the case was 10, 15 years ago, with uh, East Africa being called the new uh, oil and gas frontier, we now have that changing to what are we doing to become a source of uh, critical minerals that are needed for energy transition. So 
increasingly in the planning, both at national level and I think uh, much as it's not yet uh, very formal at uh, East African, uh, at regional level, each country is trying to say what are those uh, resources that are going to be required uh, once we transit from the fossil fuels to clean energy. What of these resources do we have as a country? What can we do to make sure that we optimize the benefits from these resources? And uh, speaking to what uh, Beatrice shared, you find uh, contracts are now being negotiated or uh, countries are making assessments and uh, geologists are valuing how much deposits they have to establish uh, what they can uh, use to, to market their country as a destination for investing in that uh, resource. So th that is one of the uh, impacts it's having because of the global conversation around it increasingly countries are saying, how do we position ourselves to not only transit for the benefit of uh, saving the planet, but also for economic reasons by uh, optimally exploiting the resources we have. And in Uganda specifically, we have a lot of uh, critical minerals that have been mapped out and uh, the Ministry of Energy and uh, Mineral Development is uh, trying as much as possible to market to the global north and the west, how these minerals are here. The same is the case in Kenya, where uh, the uh, conversation around critical minerals has uh, picked a lot of momentum. Of course, uh, Tanzania, it goes without mention, with uh, given their interest in uh, mining. So these are all impacts that are being informed by uh, the conversation on energy transition. Then, uh, increasingly, much as the, no action is uh, taking place, the rhetoric in terms of uh, uh, phasing away or moving away from uh, unclean forms of energy, where you find, uh, for example, steps are being taken to uh, uh, encourage uh, citizens to use LPG instead of firewood. Uh, and uh, subsidies are given during uh, when tax uh, bills are being amended to make sure that LPG is cheaper because it's clean. These are, are things that, in a small way, are trying to lead to that to contribute to the conversation on energy transition or uh, introduction of taxes on uh, uh, petroleum and uh, petrol products, as well as uh, tax incentives towards. Uh, electric vehicles, I'm told car as of uh, now, as of the 2023-2024 financial year, Rwanda is now importing electric cars, uh, zero rated, no tax, no nothing, where you, if you're buying an electric car, you just pay whatever price you're paying for it and it comes in country and you use it. And Rwanda has set up uh, facilities for charging electric cars, all these efforts are being done by uh, a number of East Africa member states in response to the growing conversation around energy transition, as well as uh, continuing, of course, to uh, set national targets where they're setting measures of uh, by within uh, the next five years or 10 years, this is where we want to be in terms of transitioning and participating in international uh, conversations on the same. Yeah, so there is a lot uh, this uh, energy transition uh, talk is having at national level, but what I believe is lacking, and I stand to be corrected, the, the conversation at regional level is still cluttered where it's not a collective uh, uh, intervention. It's a uh, state by state coming up with their own measures and what they think can help them at national level. And uh, as uh, ELS and also members of the East African community, what we need to look uh, for now is how do we start aggregating what Rwanda is doing, what Uganda is doing, what Tanzania and Kenya, uh, what South Sudan or DRC are doing and come up with uh, a, a regional position on some of these things. And uh, as I conclude, that's where I would want to uh, throw a spanner in the works because my, my personal position about 
energy transition is that because, as I've shared, it's informed by uh, the global concern on climate change, the measures it's coming with do not directly attend to the energy needs of the global south. So we have uh, so many people all tapping into it, but you find, as I shared in the beginning, Uganda's energy mix has biomass 90%, oil products 8%, and hydroelectricity 2%. So most of the conversation on energy transition revolving around oil products so fossil fuels in essence is looking at 8% of the energy mix meaning even if we moved from use of fossil fuels without attending to the use of biomass which is the primary uh, energy source in Uganda where firewood uh, 78% uh, charcoal about uh, 10% and then crop residue about 8%. If we don't attend to why our population is still using firewood, if we don't look for measures to grow their economic status as a, a region so that they are able to move away to cleaner energies, we can do all we want and transition from oil products but that will only be impacting 8% of the energy need of the population we are attending to. So I, I, I want us, as we discuss this, well, it's uh, very important for us as lawyers to know what inroads are we looking at. And some, as uh, it was shared, some of the lawyers are in regulatory bodies at national level, regional level, and others are advising different stakeholders. We need to know that uh, our interventions should be addressing the peculiar needs and the peculiar energy needs of the population for which we are uh, having this discussion. Otherwise, uh, 10 years, 20 years from now, we shall phase out uh, certain forms of energy, but either nothing will change because people will remain on bio using biomass, or if we force the change, we will draw people in uh, an economic uh, class that they can't afford and result into impoverishing those that cannot transit with the majority. So uh, for lack of a politer word, there is some element of elite capture in the conversation around energy transition because as uh, those who are sitting on the tables and in boardrooms discussing energy transition, are using are driving cars, so they are thinking cars are polluting. Yet it's only three percent of the population that is driving cars. Even if you stopped driving, whatever damage that is being done by the, even if you changed your energy form, that wouldn't change much because of the uh, percentage that is involved in that. So, uh, for me, I think we need to have a broader look and say. Who are we doing this for? Who is the transition about? Is it about uh, those who are uh, conceptualizing it based on their economies and the energy mix of their economy? Or as a region, we have peculiar needs that require uh, uh, customization or adapting or tweaking this conversation to fit the regional context. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, James. I'm sure all of us can tell that he's truly passionate about social and economic justice. The question that stands out is, who are we doing all of this for? Who are we transiting for? And I think that's a good point to, to transition, pun intended, word intended, into a discussion about the climate crisis and the significant role of legal practitioners in the energy transition. This discussion will be led by uh, Mr. Daudi Ramadani. Um, Mr. Ramadani is a partner at Rex Advocates. He, he holds a, a Bachelor of Laws from the University of Dar es Salaam and an LLM from the University of Cape Town. He has 10 years of experience within the legal profession 
And he has advised local and international clients in a variety of industries seeking to introduce new products and services into the Tanzanian market and ensuring regulatory compliance. Um, his experience includes advising banks, so financial institutions, um, uh, some uh, other institutions within uh, uh, the mining energy and telecom sector. Um, he's passionate about banking and financing law, and he has general experience within the corporate sector. Um, he will be taking us through, as we have said, he'll be taking us through the, the conversation about the climate crisis, because really, as, as um, uh, Professor Kairuki, as well as, as James, I think you've touched on it as, uh, as well, uh, this whole conversation about an energy transition came from the climate uh, crisis. So I'll pass the mic to you, Mr. Ramadani. Uh, please take it away. You have 10 minutes as well. Uh, thank you very much, Lynn. Uh, and I would also like to thank the um, uh, other speakers, uh, Professor Kariuki and uh, Beatrice, uh, together with uh, my friend James Mohindo for laying um, a very um, <clears throat> elaborative uh, introduction about this topic. And uh, as you, most of these previous speakers have pointed out, uh, this is something which cuts across uh, every uh, field, uh, whether you're doing law, you're doing, um, you're working in a different industry, this is something that we all have to be aware of and we have to take um, uh, uh, steps, positive steps in terms of, you know, seeing how we can eliminate the climate crisis. So in terms of um, collaboration between um, uh, legal professional and other stakeholders, uh, in my view, I think it is uh, very crucial uh, in ensuring that uh, there is an effective and equitable implementation of energy transition strategies uh, amidst the challenges posed by the climate crisis. There are several ways in which the professional um, uh, legal professionals can collaborate with uh, policymakers and other industry leaders um, and the community uh, at large in order to ensure that uh, we are tackling this crisis. And uh, some of these measures that can be collaboratively um, adopted include um, policy developments. So we as uh, legal professionals, we can contribute uh, uh, our expertise uh, in the development and analysis of the policies related to the energy transition. We can draft legislations that promote the adoption uh, of renewable energy sources, encourage energy efficiency measures and sets targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So by working closely with uh, policymakers, we can ensure that uh, the laws are robust and forcible and aligned to the goals of the um, mitigating climate change, um, some of which have been um, extensively explained by Professor um, in his opening um, presentation. In the other areas, um, such as regulatory compliance and risk management, you know, as legal professionals, we can um, play a critical role in helping businesses that we are advising and industries navigate complex legal and regulatory um, framework relating to the energy transition. We normally do advise companies on compliance with environmental uh, regulations uh, and permitting requirements for renewable energy projects. Uh, in Tanzania, we are currently undertaking quite a number of uh, you know, infrastructure projects. So as lawyers, we are quite, um, um, uh, we are sitting at a very critical position in terms of advising our clients um, on strategies for managing the legal risk associated with the transition to you know, low carbon economy, but also by, you know, we can also uh, make sure that we stay abreast of evolving regulatory landscape uh, and uh, as legal uh, expert, we can help businesses to adopt the practices that meet emerging standards and anticipated potential legal challenges. So um, in terms of the other um, mitigation uh, measure uh, as legal practitioners, we can have stakeholders engagement uh, in most of these um, uh, projects that we do advise our clients. We have to be quite conscious in terms of 
what stakeholders are involved and as legal profession professionals, we can mitigate, we can facilitate the dialogue and uh, collaboration among diverse stakeholders, including the government agencies, industry representatives, environmental organizations, and local communities. Uh, they can serve as mediators. Um, you know, we, we can we can be um, we can be sitting in between all these um, stakeholders in order to see how best we can be able to uh, negotiate uh, over the energy projects, helping to resolve conflicts and reach a mutual acceptable agreement. Uh, this will ensure that uh, we are fostering a constructive engagement and uh, consensus building. Uh, and we can promote transparency, accountability, and trust in the decision-making processes, which is a key factor uh, that you know um, informs on the success of any meaningful uh, project. But we can also uh, be quite uh, instrumental in the in various litigations and uh, legal remedies that are. Uh, you know, um, uh, taking place uh, in case where the, there's a legal dispute um, arise over an energy transition project or environmental regulations, we can provide representation and uh, advocacy in court. And this requires us to be uh, quite uh, savvy in terms of, you know, what really energy transition is all about so that we can be able to not only provide a, a, a solid advice, but something which is more practical. We can also pursue legal remedies to address um, violations of environmental laws, challenges, challenge the government um, in terms of the decisions that they have taken uh, that would have somehow adverse um, interest on the uh, communities um, in which the projects are happening. But uh, through strategic litigation, we can also uh, ensure that uh, we can hold the um, uh, government accountable uh, and whoever is uh, responsible for environmental harm and seek remedies to protect the public health. So in summary, I think collaboration between the legal professionals and uh, other stakeholders is quite essential um, for overcoming the legal, regulatory and social challenges associated with the energy transition in the face of the um, climate crisis. Thank you very much, Lynn. And over to you. Thank you, Mr. Ramadani. Yes, some some key points there. Um, as as legal professionals and other stakeholders interact, uh, the point around uh, analysis of current laws and supporting even the governments where we where we are domiciled to to put together laws that are relevant and that put in, have in mind uh, this whole move towards renewable energy, energy transition and so on, as well as strategic litigation. Again, as, as many uh, as don't understand the, the, the conversation around energy transition, um, that lack of understanding or lack of knowledge will often lead to, to mistakes being made. And so, have, doing strategic lit litigation will also help us to begin to wrap our heads around the sector and, and how we can support even governments to, to do things better. As we, we come uh, slowly to the point of, of, of having an open discussion, because this is what we wanted, we wanted to be able to listen to, to our panelists, and then we would go into a time of Q&A, and even comments would open up um, the microphones to, to participants to actually also uh, uh, participate verbally or, or openly. As we come closer to, to that point, uh, I think I'll give the opportunity uh, to Ms. Esther Githinji, I hope I have said that correctly, uh, who will discuss a forecast of energy transition, what the future holds, and maybe potential research areas. I think this could touch more than just legal professionals, but anyone who is a legal professional and might want to, to venture out a little bit, maybe in, on the development side or, you know, um, 
yeah, let's let's get into that discussion. Ms. Esther Githingi is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. She's based in Nairobi and she specializes in the energy sector. And so uh, already we have people within the East African region who, who are competent and who can carry this conversation forward. She's currently working as a legal analyst at EED Advisory Limited in Kenya. It's a research and analytics firm focusing on energy, climate change, and water. Uh, she's worked with Ofgen Limited and Kenya Renewable Energy Association before, um, gaining a lot of experience around energy-related contracts, regulatory compliance, policy and advocacy, and so on. Um, Esther, you, you are welcome to have the floor. Uh, would you like me to share my screen with your presentation? I don't even be able to share my end, so it's just a bit Which easier and smoother. Okay. okay. Uh, sure. To start off, uh, thank you so much, ELS, for having me. It's such a privilege to sit on this panel uh, with Professor Karaoke. I've definitely referenced most of his uh, writings in my research. Madam Beatrice, I've met her in a number of electricity society engagements and happy to have a chance to interact with uh, fellow colleagues from uh, other countries, um, uh, Uganda, Tanzania. It's such a privilege. And um, just to start off on a brief presentation, um, I don't know how many minutes I have, Lynn. You have 10 minutes. Okay, I'll try to keep it brief. So this is the conversation we are having. Um, I had a brief introduction um, about um, myself and the farm, which Lynn uh, clearly did. So uh, that's uh, the scope of work that we do at the moment. So looking at the image that we have on the screen, this is a satellite image of the lighting at night. As you can see, most of the East African uh, region is quite dull. That shows the amount of electricity that we have. It's quite um, very low compared to the global north. As you can see, it's quite lit. We have countries uh, in Africa, Northern and uh, most of Southern has quite a bit of electricity from this satellite image and uh, according to the International Energy Agency, uh, six, uh, 600 million people lack electricity and majority of them are in Africa. Um, this is not the latest study from uh, IRENA, so it could change, but um, we have over 182 million people that lack electricity in East Africa and um, uh, in terms of clean cooking, it goes as low as 7%. So you can see the dare need for us to transit as, as, as a region. Um, and looking at what is shaping this uh, energy transition, why are we moving towards uh, a cleaner and sustainable future for ourselves? We definitely have pledged to the SDG 7 goals, uh, 2030 goals, um, as a majority of uh, being part of uh, the UN countries. And they do have 17. We have um, goal number seven, which is ensuring access to affordable, reliable, and modern energy for all. We have the SDG 13, which is on climate actions, emphasizes on climate action, which is mitigation and adaptation. And from that context, we get um, the move to, um, to uh, mitigate and adapt to the climate change. Um, we've seen in the recent past how East Africa has has had series of droughts, floods, and uh, quite a lot of impact from uh, climate change. And as countries, we've uh, come up with uh, NDCs that are under the Paris Agreement and submitted this, and we do want to reduce carbon emission. Uh, so uh, countries have set specific targets. We have Uganda who set their target, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Kenya. Uh, you can see their percentages there. And um, so in the NDCs, they do set what what key um, actions they do want to take and the budget that is required for them. I think in Kenya now our budget is at 62 million USD. Um, so that is what is leading into us going into energy transition. We have issues on energy access uh, stemming from SDG 7. So currently those are the status of energy access. As you can see, it's quite low. Uh, this number is mostly... Um, 
uh, due to rural lack of uh, electricity in rural areas, high of the percentage comes from rural areas. But also the other push is also the advancement of technologies that is coming up that can be availed to people and also quite a number of regulatory frameworks that are coming up. We do have in Kenya the auction policy for wind and solar, which uh, tends to want to incorporate more renewable energy, uh, more renewable energy uh, into the electricity mix or although already Kenya has quite a high percentage of renewable energy uh, if I'm not wrong it should be around 80 80 percent is is it's renewable if I'm not wrong uh, so that's quite a good number but also to add more and increase electricity access so we have such uh, frameworks and policies that are assisting we, are, we recently looking at the open markets regulations, which will liberalize the electricity sector for Kenya in terms of generation distribution. So that will be quite interesting to see unfold. And um, all this uh, influence, uh, the future in um, energy in us, uh, making policies that align to these goals, having an investment focus. Uh, Kenya just launched the Energy Transition Investment Plan. Uh, it was supported by ses for all We do have the percentages of uh, percentages and amounts of money we do want, we, we have to invest into our energy transition plan. We need to have more regional cooperation. I think one of the previous speakers said that is something that is quite missing because each country is a bit doing their own, but as a region, what can we uh, harness together to do? Either it's uh, cross-boundary uh, trade of electricity, uh, having coming together and setting, uh, set, uh, setting certain targets. I think one of the Thing that has uh, one of the things that has been highlighted, I think Kenya has a cap for vehicles. Um, other countries don't. So, um, in at the end of it all, how do we uh, come about in reducing carbon emissions? If some countries, you know, you can import an old car, and some countries have gone ahead and said this is the years we want for cars. So some of those uh, disparities. So we need to improve rural electrification, um, inclusive development for the undeserved. So one of the SDG main uh, um, goal is to leave no one behind. So that is quite key. So looking even at areas of, um, <clears throat> sorry, humanitarian energy. So that has been from um like i previously said market oh, this it brings more transparency Is everything okay? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. I think. Okay. Go ahead. You have four more minutes? Yes. Four more minutes. Okay. So looking at um um so with that, we have uh, innovations uh, that are accelerating energy transition and what we can research on. We have some that are technological, so a lot of innovations on improving the efficiency of solar PVs, energy storage systems, smart grids, and some uh, innovations that support this are energy management. We have uh, system. Um, uh, digitalization of system programs such as productive use of energy that promote the uh, the increase in demand for electricity so that um, maybe someone puts up a, a fridge they can uh, in, in a rural area that is off-grid they need solar so that 
uh, increases for them a business opportunity and also increases the demand to have electricity. So some of the areas of research, so I'll skip on the need of research, I think we can see there is quite a need of research. So we need research on standardizations of this renewable energy technologies, not that this country has set standards and then this other country doesn't have certain standards. So uh, the products in the market are quite mixed and uh, customers are not uh, are not satisfied by such. We need data analysis, policy research. We need uh, research on financing mechanism, which is quite a huge uh, area uh, local banks uh, are actually coming up to learn about green financing and um, it's quite quite interesting uh, also as uh, uh, legal persons you can specialize in the energy markets like i said kenya we are opening up our energy markets and investors will definitely want to come to lawyers and ask how do you go about it so there's quite a lot of room cross boundary energy trade and uh, greening of various sectors like transport. Um, so we need to uh, come together and uh, collaborate uh, uh, as policy makers uh, create these regulations and as the industry people that it applies to us to make sure that we uh, are able to uh, implement uh, apply and uh, enable the implementation of them, also grow the sector by, <clears throat> by doing a lot of innovations, a lot of research, uh, which now as researchers, we come in play in generating uh, knowledge, uh, looking at impact assessment and uh, coming up with evidence-based uh, data that influence decision-making. I think in my, in my organization, this is uh, basically what we do. So come up with uh, data on electricity access, electricity demand, currently developing the uh, cooking strategy uh, for Kenya, um, uh, the trend, the cooking transition. So looking at what access is there for people uh, in terms of clean cook stoves, uh, what percentage have electricity if they're using e-cooking and coming up with policies and strategies in, in how to uh, enforce uh, the clean cooking strategy. I think in Eastern Africa, one of our biggest emitters is, I think in Kenya, we are at 30, 40% comes from clean cooking, comes from cooking, uh, cooking with dirty uh, fuels that is firewood. And uh, so there's, there's quite a lot of room for us to transit and also meet our NDCs. And it's important for us to do research and be able to influence this these decisions um, as we go ahead. So uh, that will be my presentation. I hope it was uh, informative and happy to take up any questions and interact later. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Esther, I, I like how this is going. We are getting closer to landing the plane safely. I want to go back to Professor Kariuki um, because Prof, as, as, you, as you understand, as you know, we, 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 we were hoping to hear from you uh, more extensively about strategies that East African partner states can adopt to accelerate this energy transition in the region. Of course, this is with the understanding that energy transition is happening and we cannot find ourselves in, in a position where we, we miss out as, as, as a region. Also, all the speakers before have spoken extensively about what the real issues are and the, and the real issues are energy access issues for, for the members of the East African community for the citizens within the East African community. So what, what strategies are these that the East African partner states can, can adopt? I also wanted to just add one, uh, one more question that that's, is within the chat that I think that you, you can address uh, directly. Actually, I think two. The, the first one is, is from David Kiyama who is asking what the nexus is between economic development and energy transition. It might sound like it's obvious, 
uh, but maybe if you'll take a minute or two to touch on that. Uh, the second question is from Clever Nigarura, who is asking, is there a need for an ESC climate change bill and a renewable energy bill uh, at the re regional level? I do know that there is an East African community energy policy which uh, seeks to address issues around climate change. Uh, but uh, Clever's question is, is there a need for uh, actual uh, legal uh, or, or, or regulatory framework at the East African level uh, to take this discussion forward? So let me give you the floor and give you 10 minutes to, to touch everywhere you feel like touching. You, you, you are the expert. We're looking at you, sir. I will say something about uh, uh, some of these questions. We've had only one hour, and uh, uh, some of these questions need reading. I did say that uh, I have uh, materials online. All my papers, everything that I've ever written is online, downloadable for free. Every book that I've ever written is also downloadable for free. That this is significant because it's a decision I had to make to make sure that this information is available. But having said that, let me just uh, make broad statements because I have very few minutes that uh, enable us to reflect on certain things. Relating to this question, lawyers are always asking, where does the law come in? And I say to the lawyers, don't think law. You know, law is a pretender. Roscoe Pound says, look, that a law is a tool of social engineering. But how many people do you see carrying statutes as they walk around in the villages? So law has a limited role to play within a framework that we call PESTEL, that we use the PESTEL analysis to analyze political, economic, social, technical, ecological, and legal. I'll say it again, political economic, social, technological, ecological, and legal. So you see, law comes in last. So if you are entering this debate, you must be able to ask yourself, what is the political environment around this discussion? What is the economic uh, environment? In fact, half of environmental law is in economics itself. Because uh, natural resources, including oil, fuel, um, oil and gas, are used to drive the economy forward or backwards. If you are familiar with oil, a lot of African countries and other countries have been driven backwards to conflict by oil. In fact, I used to hear that if we discover oil as uh, Kenya, for example, we are going to prosper economically. I'm still waiting. So it is linked. You must look at the analysis in that broad sense. And, uh, and look for solutions, not just in law, but as broadly as possible. For example, scientific solutions. If you have a way of uh, cleaning up water using chlorine, for example, why would you then make so many laws around it? Just clean it up. If there's a technology that scrubs uh, greenhouse gases from a system, use it. If there is something that... Uh, takes care of our pollinators and biodiversity, use it. So in other words, you should enter this space as a lawyer with broad knowledge. That uh, brings me to what uh, Beatrice told us earlier, that what we are getting out of the universities might not be what is required in industry. Beatrice, you have a standing invitation to my class. Because in my class, we don't. I don't teach. We watch videos. We discuss science, technology, and we have uh, we have those discussions that go very deep into it. I tell my students, don't go into oil and gas or energy if you don't understand the basics. Don't talk about P LPG if you don't know the full meaning of LPG. So we have a lot of things to do as lawyers to enter this space. And there is a lot of work for us beyond making of laws and regulation. Because by the time you come to regulation, you must then understand uh, policy, for example. 
and it brings me back to your earlier question. What policy initiatives should we have to incentivize the adoption of clean energy? What is it you must tell a villager about clean energy? What is uh, clean energy in Kiswahili or some local language? And James, I agree with you, this thing has been captured. There's elite capture. So can we transport this knowledge to the average person? Can this discussion be about energy as a human right? There are so many people who disagree with me when I say energy is a human right. But just uh, last year, the right to a clean and healthy environment, which is reflected in our Article 42, became a human right. Okay. Just last week, uh, the United Nations sat and the AI became uh, a tool for sustainable development. This is a resolution dated, I think, last week. So we are saying, how do we bring this conversation to the average person on the ground? Um, how do we bring energy justice into it? And this is viable. And how do we involve everyone? There's, uh, I think Esther has said, we must not leave anybody behind. Is there such a thing as environmental democracy? Many years ago when I posited it, I was laughed at. Today, I think it's it's there, environmental democracy. The idea of involving everyone in decision-making, what is called subsidiarity, that decisions are made at the lowest level. I was once doing a, a consultancy in energy, and we wrote the final report, and the, by the time I looked at the final report, it had human rights within it. But I think somebody edited it out in favor of ease of access uh, to investments. So we favored the investor more than human rights issues. Beatrice, you mentioned ESG. It's a pet subject of mine. I'm not talking about it today. But every lawyer must know something about environmental, social, and governance. It's in our Article 11, sustainable development in the Kenyan context. But ESG is where litigation is. The future is ESG. You'll be litigating about environment, social, and governance. So I think this space is for lawyers. And I'm generally saying lawyers are welcome in, inside here. And there is a lot to do. But you could also be an investor in wind, solar, hydropower, tidal energy, what uh, James Mohindo called the energy mix. And the idea here is to have a, a healthy energy mix. And do we have that in East Africa? Maybe not. What is it we need to do to have it? How do we lower connectivity charges? Those tokens that we buy, and uh, they last just a few minutes, how can we bring it lower? And I remember a while back when the rural electrification started, for about $30, I was able to put up electricity in my rural home. But this has gone up. So how can we keep those charges low? It is uh, all right to tell somebody, use LPG, but is it available? At what cost? Is LPG available in the villages? Have you ever seen any being piped to the villages? So you're telling somebody, don't cut that tree for firewood. You can use electricity. Really? So we must relate this conversation to, to the ground. Last time I tried to cook using electricity, it was uh, an equivalent of 80,000 shillings a month. And uh, the power company said, look, uh, we can discuss it, but you pay fast. How can we have energy efficiency? How can we have reliability? Because unreliable energy supply is what makes us go to these alternative uh, sources of, uh, to, to the fossil fuels and other fuels. If you come to my house today, you'll find there's charcoal. There's even firewood I discovered. Why? Because... Uh, the other sources of energy are unreliable, including electricity. Power could go off anytime. And don't tell me that the solar panels are cheaper. They are not cheaper. And if you now go to DRC Congo and talk about solar panels, the ingredients have something to do with uh, human rights abuses. If we made Africa green, 
really, we must get all those minerals, the critical minerals we spoke about from Africa itself. So how can we then have a reasonable discussion? How can we make our institutions like the Rural Electri Electrification and Renewable Ener Energy Corporation, REREC, more responsive on the ground? And we are also asking the question, how can the African countries, those uh, East African countries, work together, get the private sector? And the private sector wants something else. They want to hear tax subsidies. They want to hear rebates. They want to hear incentives. Our law talks about rebates, but I haven't seen any being given. And our solar, for example, is still expensive. You heard that the regulations are not there yet. So it's not more law we are looking for, but more practical measures to ensure that we have adoption policies that work on the ground. We need research and development. How much of that are we doing? And what is it we are going to give to the private sector to balance with what we are giving to the average person? What about the decision-making process? To whom, whom do we involve? How, who are the stakeholders? How do we bring them to the table so that we have what is called energy justice, energy democracy? All those things. Um, and can we get this through regional cooperation? If we do cooperate in infrastructure projects, who is going to finance them? And at what, what are the terms of financing? Because uh, we are not short of uh, infrastructure projects in Africa, but they are financed on loan basis. So we become beggars for life. So do we need, and some people ask you, look, why do I need to be a beggar for life? And I can mine my coal or my oil, like uh, the first world? And that question has to be answered. There's an attempt to answer it in S SDG 17, funding mechanisms. But are they really working or do we need to engage in a very, very, very deliberate manner with the first world and tell them, look, you have used, or you, uh, you've cut down your forests, you have used your coal, oil and gas, you've developed yourself. Now you're telling us not to touch ours. How can we finance this? practically. And if we are working as countries, how do we then have uniform policies uh, across uh, the region? How do we remove trade barriers? How do we open up borders? We keep uh, paying lip service to opening borders. How do we access markets uh, between the countries? We are still quarreling about oil and gas and energy. Why must we do that across uh, borders? Why can't we have good neighborliness? Okay. Why can't we have friendly political relations, even before we come to the law itself? Uh, there have been talk about a single currency. Will it help? Or must we use the dollar? You see, if you're in oil and gas, you know the importance of the dollar. And uh, would, can you go to any other currency? Would you be allowed? Um, what else haven't I talked about? ESG. There's a lot of uh, work for lawyers. Carbon credits. I wrote a whole paper the other day on managing disputes in carbon credits. The paper is available. Within that paper, you will see where the lawyers come in. And uh, this is linked to our Climate Change Act. There is uh, carbon credits mentioned there, carbon trade, how it works, basically, but you'd have to find out how it works and also where to take the disputes. It's a National Environment Tribunal within Kenya, and internationally, there is arbitration, negotiation, and so on. So you can, as a lawyer, then combine all these skills that you have under, for example, conflict management under Article 33 of the UN Charter. So you can negotiate, mediate, arbitrate, and use other mechanisms. But you must be that lawyer who is changing and getting used to the idea of seeing no law anywhere. You see policy, you see politics, you see many other things if you enter a boardroom. And you wonder, where are the lawyers coming in? The lawyers, I think, have to change under what is called a certificate of urgency and get into these spaces and uh, ensure that the debate is not driven by the North. 
It is a debate uh, that can be held in a village. And if you can hold this debate in a village and tell them, why is it that we are transiting? What is this transition? And why is it important? What is this climate change thing? And I've heard people say it's a fiction. Actually, it's not. But how do we get that message to the average person? In short, there's a lot of work to be done. There is a energy democracy to be achieved. First of all, we have to even coin up that and agree there is something like energy democracy. There is this rhetoric about nobody should be left behind. We should make it work. And uh, it is possible, in conclusion, I say, to accelerate energy transition within our region. And uh, the stakeholders are very, very, very many. We must bring all of them on board. Can I stop there for now, before I do three hours? Thank you very much, Prof. Wow, I've I scribbled, I've been in class. Like you're, 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 truly, um, you're truly a professor, you're truly a teacher. Thank you. You have touched on, on many issues, um, spoken to some comments that are in the chat uh, from Anna Klet to Riachira. She says, she, well, this individual says regulatory enforcement and compliance culture is minimal. And, and this speaks to an issue around governance, which you have spoken uh, well about. Uh, John Mbogo from, from Tanzania as well uh, talks about government interference uh, and minimal regulatory support. Again, it's, it's like that the law is not enough and we need to begin to look for practical solutions within, within our region. Richard Shilamba talked about uh, the biggest carbon emitter being the developed world. And, and yet they are the ones who are pushing the, the conversation about energy transition. And so you speaking about a uh, certificate of urgency and, and us making sure that as far as we can, we make sure that this, uh, this, this debate is not driven by the West, but it's driven uh, by us within our jurisdictions. You talked about uh, funding mechanisms. Uh, under SDG 17, and, and that again is, is an issue of governance and economic uh, justice across the board, not just within the energy sector. Um, Hilda and Simire, uh, I saw your comment about, uh, or a question about throwing more light on carbon credits, and, and uh, the, the professor has said he has uh, a lot of work that he has written, which you can easily find on the World Wide Web. Uh, I see your hand is up. I'll give you an opportunity to speak. Alan Rakakoko also talks about the, 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 the debate around electricity. And so within the East African region, one thing that is true is that uh, to answer the questions around energy transition and climate change, uh, the governments of East Africa have, have uh, put a lot of money investment into uh, building uh, hydroelectric power plants and, and providing rural electric electricity and so on. Uh, but there's, there's so many troubles in there. In Uganda alone, there, there, there are court cases, arbitration issues around uh, electricity and who manages our electricity distribution and so on. And so Alan is saying, um, how about solar and biomass and beginning to have very specific conversations about how to uh, improve, innovate uh, around uh, solar provision, uh, solar energy, as well as biomass. Indeed, Olivia is saying, who are we transi transiting for? Uh, she's repeating that question that, that uh, James first brought on the table, who are we transiting for? Indeed, if we are transiting, which it's, it's no longer a mystery or a story, it is actually happening, can we make sure that we are transiting uh, one key thing, again, that I picked up is law has a limited role to play. And, and so the earlier we begin to look for uh, practical solutions, the better for us. So much great stuff going on here. Uh, I see some hands. I'll start with Felix Okanga. Your hand has been up for some time now. So please take it away. Question or comment, one minute. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, I don't know if they can hear me. 
now uh sorry i've confirmed you can hear me i've just typed my question uh just before you gave me the opportunity to speak uh in essence if i can summarize that question i'm asking <coughs> um whether africa as a continent should first be given the opportunity to quote and quote pollute before then being uh, uh, transiting on their own terms, it feels like we are almost being forced to transit before polluting through industrialization, like the first world countries had the opportunity to do. So should we then first be allowed to pollute, quote unquote, not, in, not necessarily that we're going to venture out for pollution, but to first industrialize, and then now we transit on our own terms. That's my question. Thank you, Felix. Uh, I think that, that that train is already, it, it left the station, but somebody will answer you uh, more specifically. Yes, in Simire Hilda, please go ahead. Thank you for your question, Felix. Hilda, please unmute. You might be speaking, but you are still muted. Hello? Hello, Hilda? I'm sorry, I don't know what's what's happening with Hilda. Uh, any any amongst the panelists who would like to speak to to Felix's question or musing? Yeah? Let them allow us uh, to call you. <laughs> uh, I can uh, take a shot at uh, Felix's uh, question. Uh, I think uh, Felix's uh, question. Uh, speaks to some of the things I mentioned earlier, where mm -hmm. without uh, taking his uh, words for what, for the without uh, sticking to the words he used, the question is, uh, should Africa be allowed to develop the way it knows how so that the conversation, if, uh, if the conversation transition later. And I think what, what uh, uh, is missing in the question is that Hello, James. Is it just me? Hello? There you are. You is it only me who dropped off? Yes. My apologies. Yeah, I so think... there is a presumption that uh, there is a prefect out there who's policing the world to make sure that uh, we transit. But because of state sovereignty, the basics of international law, each state party has sovereignty to develop how it knows how. Well, because right. of the things we've signed to, including uh, the Paris Agreement and the UNFC since uh, 1993, there, is, mm. there are certain parameters within which we should develop. As a country or a region, we can come together and say, based on the available alternatives, and I like uh, the um, analysis uh, model or uh, tactic that Professor political, economic, social, technical, ecological, and then legal, we think this is how we should go. So if as a region we believe uh, we still have a lot to benefit from fossil fuels, but we are aware, we are making that this decision, aware that and there is energy transition to bear in mind or climate change, 
then we are at liberty to take that road. Of course, that is subject to the consequences that may come with it, as Prof shared, there are financing issues where increasingly certain financing institutions are tying environmental uh, conditionalities to their loans. So it means right. you will not access those, but that does not mean there are no financing opportunities that will be open to you. Uh, for example, with what Uganda is grappling with, uh, with financing for ECOP, uh, sometime last month, there were conversations with uh, China, which is willing to fund. So we need to come to the room, as Prof said, with a very open mind, knowing first we are not asking anyone for permission to develop. We have to develop the way we know how, just like no one asked us for permission in the North when they were developing. Then secondly, we have to bring every alternative on the table and assess it on its merit, and then pick what we shall take based on that. And with, with that, I think I uh, uh, answer Felix's question that no, Africa does not, first of all, need to ask anyone to allow it. And secondly, yes, it has a chance that is its own to determine whether it's feasible or not. Yes. May Absolutely. I? Thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead, Prof. Uh, the train has left the station. What I heard you mumbling. We cannot go to that position where we are saying we have a right to develop any way we know how. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, there was a time the other day when uh, we lifted the lead on uh, the, or the ban on forests. And within two days, mm -hmm. within two days only, our forests were going. Because how do we cut forests nowadays? You use a parcel. So even you, Lynn, can cut a whole forest within a week. Yeah. We can't go that way. If you look at our coal plants, and there was one coal plant that was about to be put up in Lamu, it was um, it was stopped by the National Environment Tribunal. That case is still in court. We are talking about emissions like sulfur. Sulfur plus um uh, carbon dioxide will make uh, sulfur dioxide you put a bit of water you have sulfuric acid so it will be acid water acid rain yeah do we need that so with with what we know now we cannot go back there we have hydro we have the biggest rivers in the world they in uh, africa we have solar we have wind we have these alternatives ready for us what we don't seem to have and that, that is where the beef is, is the money to unlock these developments. And I think we can negotiate for it one way or the other. But it's possible to kill ourselves within a week if we go through the older routes that uh, those countries went through. Remember, even in the USA, there was a, a whole town that was uh, wiped out one night. It's a story for another day. 4,000 people died within one night because a factory was emitting sulfur dioxide. So there was temperature inversion. By morning, people didn't wake up. So we can't go there, but we can ask the question, how do we politically maneuver uh, around it? Economically, how do we finance? Scientifically or technologically, how do we get it done? Mm -hmm. And then legally, in terms of regulation, how do we go there? But we cannot uh, beat our chests and say we have a right to develop. Remember, if we, for example, interfere with one river mm -hmm. that comes from Kenya, Tanzania is affected. That's true. If we kill all our elephants here, they're the same elephants that cross over and our game and all that. The world is so interconnected. Remember the battle on a ozone layer. It was won by multilateralism. Countries stood together. Mm. So we are so connected that it is possible to kill ourselves within a very short time. Are we having a discussion about uh, toxic waste somewhere in Kenya? I hope it's not true. But now we know what toxic waste can do. So I, I think the train has left. I agree with Lynn. We must look for these alternatives, and we have them, and make them affordable for everybody, and involve everyone in the discussion in the language they understand. Thank you. For sure. For sure. Um, I think, Lynn, if you allow me to comment, 
Um, I'd, I'd like us to just uh, flash back to the image that Esther projected. I think it was the image of um, Africa and mm -hmm. uh, how dark the continent was. Huh? And I think Africa is in a very unique uh, situation because it's one of the areas that um, are underdeveloped in terms of energy. And we actually have an opportunity to develop it as we wish. Um, I think the term that is that tends to be used is that we can leapfrog. So um, I think, true, historically for for industrial development, there's been heavy reliance on you know coal and the like. But we have an opportunity now to leapfrog. If you look, say, I can give two examples. I'll give the example of Kenya where we have uh, rich uh, geothermal resources. Yeah? Those provide good baseload power that we can actually tap into. But having said that, there's the other extreme where um, you have Nigeria that has the, you know, it has oil. So I think the question then becomes what will happen when you leave some of these assets stranded in the ground? So I think the better way to look at it is to look at uh, a transition. I think a transition has to happen, but um, more about a just transition. How do we achieve it? Um, and it may not be that we exploit all the oil that we have, but there are also some transition fuels that are available. For example, in Tanzania, there's the LNG. That's a very good transition fuel that's not polluting like um, you know the oil would be. Uh, it's not green, but it's not. Uh, it, it can actually help us with the transition. It's unfair to think that we can also transition right away. And I think the conversation should be about how we move. Yeah, and that's why we're using the term transition. But in terms of uh, having to move, I think even economically, um, for as long as this is all driven by the holders of the money, and for as long as we can't develop these resources, I think. Um, I was also involved in the coal plant that the professor has talked about. And, you know, initially it was it was on, in progress, but you see with time, even the financiers pulled out because they said we are no longer funding that kind of technology. You see? Mm -hmm. so, so you find that, um, you know, we'll have to be realistic. We have a chance because we have all these renewables. We have, um, you know, a very good solar, very good best winds in the world. Um, so, so we can use those. There's now new technology, there's green hydrogen now, and it's being looked at that it shall actually be produced in Africa and either used here and even in, exported to some of the other countries to help them with some of the fuel needs. So we have the chance to leapfrog, but let's also use, look at how we can use the resources we have to help us transition. Yes, very true. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. June, Cynthia, Okello, you had your hand up. Uh, or was your issue uh, sorted? Um, thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate the presentations by the panelists. Thank you so much for your insights. Um, I think most of what I had wanted to say originally has been mentioned by uh, the learned professor Karuki. I just wanted to respond to the right to development narrative, which happens to be kind of a false narrative in my opinion. And I think in most people's opinions, because uh, from the information we have now in April, 2024, we can't now be saying let's pollute and then now transition. I think that will be just shooting yourself in the leg. Um, I think we're discussing this just transition. We are, sorry, we are having this conversation on just transition because of climate change. And we cannot downplay the effects of climate change. I, I think we need to keep that in mind. So in the process, when we talk about, um, for example, um, natural gas as a transition fuel, I just wanted to hear your opinion uh, from the panelists. Because I'm thinking, Natural gas has been also stated as a false narrative as a transition fuel because it still emits 50-60% of carbon. So that, I mean, 50 to 60% less, carb it has 50 to 60% less carbon emission. 
meaning it still has carbon emission. When we talk about Africa, Africa has 65%, if I'm not wrong, of the critical minerals requires in, required in this transition. Why can't you go for the cobalt, graphite, lithium, ETC, instead of the natural gas? So I just wanted to hear from the panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, Lynn. Hi, Esther. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Pardon? Yeah, I can just put a small comment. Uh, definitely there are a bit of false narrative. Oh dear, I think the network is... Is it me? Hello? I think we've lost can, you, can you hear us? Hello, Esther. Hmm. Esther disappeared. Disappeared. Her network is hanging a bit. Can, can I give half of the answer? Yes, please go ahead. Nobody has a final solution here. It's a question mm -hmm. of reflecting wow. on uh, many concepts that are before us, making oh. choices for Africa seeing what it is that Africa has now oh. that it can exploit without killing everybody else, including the Africans themselves. Right. So if we have, um, for example, LPG has its own problems, but LPG is certainly cleaner than the firewood that I see. You know, in the houses we were brought up in, some of them used to be so smoky, and we know for a fact that people have died out of that inhalation of smoke. Look, we have uh, projects now going uh, around the country in East Africa on clean cookers. You are using firewood, but it's made in such a way that there is no smoke and there is optimization of that fire. So it's a gradual process. It's a process where we grow into it. The transition will take many, many years. But what we are asking for is a just transition that carries everyone on board, the rich, the poor, the multinationals, and everybody else. Incidentally, I'm not in favor of everybody getting uh, something that is made of cobalt, because how is it mined? You, we have other issues relating to mining, mining ethics, human rights abuses, and so on. Those green minerals that Africa has, we have to address the question, how are we getting them off the ground? So there are many, many alternatives, and it's contextual. You go to village A, you ask them, what can you do about this? Bearing in mind mm -hmm. that uh, climate change is, uh, is is real, and we've seen that mm -hmm. uh, climate change is real. So within that context, you work your way to the next village and the next village and the next village. Mm -hmm. That way we can have real conversations with real people about real solutions from them. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Esther, you 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 cut off a bit as you were making your submission. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, yes, I, I do agree with uh, what Professor is saying, and I just wanted to add one point. Uh, like you said, it's not looking at how we make these uh, processes and uh, the end product more sustainable and less damaging. Um, a lot of technology is going into uh, reducing carbon emissions, like some sectors cannot fully transit. Some sectors are solely driven by... Uh, by fossil fuels called the aviation industry. So, and also most countries uh, do have coal for their electricity um, electricity needs. So it's more of looking into research and development on how this can be more sustainable, more green. So um, just to end the, the false narrative that will go to 100%. And also considering that East Africa Mainly, majority of its energy is green. We use a lot of hydro in Kenya, I think, um, and a lot of um, now incorporating solar and wind. So um, that would be my addition. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Can I also chip in? Sure. Uh, I, I just uh, want to make it clear that, as I mentioned, that we need to move away from 
the question that uh, Felix, uh, you, the words that uh, he picked, I think in the message he has clarified, which me, where he was emphasizing being allowed to pollute. I think he didn't mean that. It just means being allowed time to transition. And I think as a prof uh, properly mentioned, this is about a just transition. And the just transition should be looked at uh, both horizontally and vertically. And I think in terms of horizontal, of a transition being just, we are looking at different social classes within a community, within a country, within a region. Let it be just insofar as it's not about uh, people living in high-end apartments in Nairobi, but it's about those also in the village in uh, Eastern Uganda where they, they have no access to electricity and other amenities. But also horizontal in terms of it's not about uh, what uh, Europe is looking at and the timelines they are setting, but about a country like Uganda where 90% are still depending on biomass. So if it's to be just, in, you, you find Uganda has to be allowed time to transit that mm -hmm. Germany may not. And uh, to the example for like coal now, where the 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 hard talk comes in from where Kenya shuts down its coal uh, project, and during COVID, as soon as uh, uh, Russia puts pressure and closes taps of gas, and uh, there is a crisis in Germany, they reopen coal mines. So you find the ones who are not financing the project in Kenya because it's uh, dirty are uh, opening coal mines in Germany. And because we are looking at this in isolation, what is Kenya's obligation? Let's close these things and all, and the impact they are having. We lose sight of the fact that a country that has not only benefited in the past, but has also caused a lot of pollution, is reopening its projects that are going to cause more harm. So we need uh, to look at a just transition in the context of how does every country irrespective of its limitations, prosper? And how do we make sure that this transition is uh, all encompassing for different social classes in whatever jurisdiction that work is being done? Yeah, so I think uh, we, we need to hold our horses in terms of uh, the use of uh, Africa being allowed to pollute that language or uh, energy or Africa exploiting its resources. But I think it's used in moderation to mean let it be just so that everyone can do what is uh, uh, humanly possible in their circumstances as a country, as an economy to transit, as opposed to setting timelines that will choke certain jurisdictions in the medium or long term and mm. end up disadvantaging them because we didn't have what it took. We started running and the leapfrogging, uh, the use of leapfrogging as uh, Beatrice shared, we, we, well, it's possible, but you, you can't crawl and then run. You have to fast walk. And we need, uh, as we try to say, let the walking be limited so that we start running with the rest. There is need for time to at least take a few steps of walking and it's those steps that, that the likes of Felix could call uh, a few polluting interventions here and there, which in essence remains alive to the need for us to transit. And that's what I would call just transition in my view. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'll give uh, Mr. Ramadani, do you have any comments to make as we slowly land this plane in, in the next few minutes. Uh, thank you, thank you, Lynn. Um, I, I thank you for all the contributions. And I think um, uh, one important point is that uh, you know when we talk about this energy transition, it's um, it is something that we 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 all need to be um, aware that it's not a one size fits all. I appreciate the comment made by uh, uh, my friend James Mohindo um, that you know. It has to be both vertically and horizontally um, uh, considered for all the for all the um, players. Uh, so we really have to find a way in which that you know 
um, we could leverage on the research that is being done in order to see how best um, the, the Africa, which is very rich in um, uh, resources, is uh, able to um, have, an, um, have a stake in the technologies that would somehow uh, reduce the impact to the climate. Yeah. Yes, Over thank to you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, somebody called Ghetto Bai has a hand up. If you could make your comment or question in 30 seconds, that would be appreciated. Please unmute. Hello? Hmm. All right, Prof, you, you, you had your hand up as well. Uh, uh, so I just you, wanted to say that um, th this topic is not very complicated. If you look at it from the point of view of some villager somewhere, you will mm. see, for example, if you talk about solar, in Africa, we have 12 hours a day of solar. How do we use it? We wake up in the morning and we use it for light, lighting. We use it uh, for vitamin D. We use it for drying of crops and all that. In the North Pole, they only have two days. One long night, half the year, another long night, uh, another long day in the in the other year. So it is not a new idea. It is the resources that we have. If you go to, within my country, you go to the mountain area and a few other places, there are many hydroelectric projects that have been initiated by locals. Not big ones, mini hydros. And there are very many. So we already have one, the solar. How are you using the solar? And we don't have to bring all those panels. You can use the solar directly. The reason why you are not dressed in uh, jackets, heavy jackets today, all of you, is because you are using solar since morning. If you go to Germany, you go to the North Pole again, you will be forced to wear those things. You'll be forced to look for natural gas or coal. So we are already uh, privileged in so many ways. Can we use what we have and ask the question, what can we do as we move along slowly towards uh, a just transition? Justice is a part of it, really. Thank you. Fantastic. What a wonderful time we have had, uh, short as it was. Thank you to your panelists for your contributions, for presentations. Uh, Thank you to the participants, the attendees, for your interaction and your, your time as well. Uh, at this point, I will hand the mic back to Gabriel um, as we close this. Thank you very, very much, all of you, for your participation and your, your contributions. We will be sharing the presentations. Um, uh, in the course uh, within the course of next week. Thank you again and again. Gabriel, over to you. Oh well, thank you so much, Lean and our dear uh, panelists, uh, Prof. Uh, Prof. Uh, James, Esther, uh, Dowdy, Beatrice, uh, for that very wonderful uh, session. We were indeed quite uh, enlightened on uh, quite a number of aspects uh, pertaining energy transition. Uh, ladies and gentlemen who have been uh, patient for these two hours taking down notes, thank you so much. Uh, you're the reason why we do this every week. Uh, and uh, from us at the Secretariat, we are really grateful for all your support. So this conversation will on the 16th when we have a discussion on the carbon markets. Please be sure to uh, catch that discussion. It will be happening on Tuesday next week. However, on Friday, uh, we'll be discussing cross-border crime in East Africa. Uh, you also want to catch that discussion on Friday 12th. We have experts brought from across the region uh, these are big names sitting in ODPP uh, in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and even Rwanda. So you want to cut that conversation. So um, 
a recording, like Lynn has said, uh, will be shared with you and attached will be presentations uh, of the different submissions made by the speakers. Uh, we'll also issue out uh, certificates of participation to uh, the participants and certificates of appreciation to you, our esteemed panelists, for your contribution uh, in this session. From us, from the ELS House, uh, we wish you all a very happy Eid. Uh, enjoy the festivities and we'll touch base again on Friday. So have yourselves a lovely afternoon. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.